Hello, everyone. Welcome to the award ceremony for the Champaign Public Library's second annual short story contest. My name is Salem, and I will be serving as your host tonight. This year, we received 30 story submissions from our talented community writers. Tonight, we'll listen to a dramatic reading of the top three stories and find out who will receive the grand prize for best short story in 2020. I'd like to begin by introducing our judges, Ekta Garg and Jim O'Brien. Ekta began her career in publishing, working as the editor for the Pamphlet Media in Portland, Oregon. Since then, she has written and edited in multiple areas, including healthcare, home improvement, and Hindi film. In 2010, she added blogging to her resume by starting The Right Edge. This is where you can find her short fiction, book reviews, parenting adventures, and where you can contact her if you're interested in hiring her as an editor. Ekta, thank you for being here. Jim is a founder of CU Poetry Group, to which he devotes his time and experience to help others hone their poetry skills. Jim recently won the Volunteer Ace Award from 40 North 88 West for, quote, sharing his passion for poetry and spoken word in an engaging and supportive manner, and for his dedication in creating a venue for writers of all levels to gather, discuss, interact, and share their voice. Jim, thank you for being here as well. And now, without further ado, let's find out which stories placed in the top three. So in third place, winning a one-year subscription to Writer's Digest magazine and the story published on our website for the community to read is, drum roll, the story Sarah and Me, written by Louise Audrey. Congratulations, Louise. Louise will now read her story, Sarah and Me, followed by feedback from our judges. Thank you. Sarah and me. I have no clear idea of what exactly happened, but this is what I remember. Dad is driving. Mom is helping by pointing out recently established speed limits and opportunities for him to practice safe driving habits. She likes to do this. It makes her feel useful. My sister Sarah and I are in the back seat of the car bickering over territory. Sarah is 10 and I am eight. In three months, I'll be nine, almost catching up to my big sister. During the part of the year when she is two whole years older than I am, she acts like she's the boss of me. I think it's all in her head. I think we will always be 18 months apart. She's taken up the whole seat with her stuff, whined Sarah. Am not, I say. Look at all this stuff Lucy brought. It's my stuff, I yell. It's taking too much room. Mom said I could bring whatever I wanted. Mom, girls, girls, says Mom. Quiet down, your father is trying to drive. Even though Sarah and I are each buckled into our own separate sides of the vehicle with a whole huge expanse of back seat between us, we still argue over space. My entire box set of Ramona and Beza's books, my stuffed elephant wolf, and a string of plastic beads are sprawling between us. But Sarah hasn't brought anything along on this outing. So why is she complaining anyway? Sarah is in the act of shoving my books into my hip. Mom is turning around in her seat to quiet us and I am feeling indignant about being crowded when the whole world slams sideways. Books and beads fly through the air. Sarah tilts like a domino into my shoulder. I feel the seatbelt dig in as I crash into the right side of the vehicle. Everything happens in silence and slow motion. Just as mom and dad are wrapped in the airbags that have surrounded them, 
A huge whiteness explodes beside me and blocks my view. But I can see Sarah smashed up beside me. She looks angry. Then blackness. Much later, I hear adults talk about a heavy piece of metal that could easily have decapitated somebody. Did it come through the left side window? Is that what hit me in the head? No one ever answers that question. Blackness. I'm aware of mom and dad talking quietly. I can almost but not quite understand what they are saying. I want to join the conversation, but nothing seems to work. My mouth and tongue don't want to move. I can't make my voice work. I feel like my mouth is full of cotton. My eyes won't open. I remain still. Blackness. I'm not alone. A woman very far away is talking. Is she talking to me? I think she wants me to do something. She's calling my name. Lucy. Lucy, she says. Lucy, can you hear me? I don't answer. If I let her know I can hear, she'll want me to do stuff. I'd rather just drift. Lucy, wake up, she says. Wake up, honey. Open your eyes. Who is this person calling me honey? I'm not her honey. Then I hear mom's voice. Lucy, darling, is she awake? Mom sounds excited and afraid. Her voice becomes waverly like she's crying. I open my eyes. My head hurts. The lights are too bright. Lucy, honey, it's mommy. Honey, wake up. I'm right here. You're going to be all right now. Everything is going to be all right. Mom's using that crooning tone like when I have a nightmare. I open my eyes again. It's too bright and it makes my head hurt. Everything looks blurry. I'm not in my own bed. The light is wrong and it smells funny. Like the kitchen after mom scrubs the floor or the dentist's office. Gradually, I can see better. Besides mom, I see a strange woman in a print shirt and blue sweater. She must have been the first voice. She leaves. Sarah is standing beside my bed. I give her a meager smile. I don't think she's mad at me anymore. Blackness. I hear a man talking. He wants me to open my eyes again. I don't want to, but he insists. He points a bright light in my eyes. He holds my eyelids open one at a time and points his bright light. My head hurts. I don't like it at all. I have a big bandage around my head. It itches, but the man says not to touch it. Finally, I'm given some water to drink. I'm very thirsty. I don't want the food they bring. It smells bad. I'm in a hospital because of the accident. I'm in a bed with rails on the side so I don't fall out like I'm a baby or something. Blackness. A long time passes. All I remember is blackness and being wakened to eat or drink. I have to go to the bathroom in a pan in the bed. I don't like it. I can sit up when the bed is raised, but mostly have to just lay there and get bored and sleepy. Sometimes when I wake up, Mom and Dad and Sarah are there. Sometimes it's just Sarah. Blackness. Sarah and I are running in the grass. She has wolf and she giggles as she keeps him just out of my reach. If I was older and taller and faster, I'd have him. When the woman with the blue sweater comes in my room, Sarah fades away. It was just a dream. Blue sweater lady puts me in a wheelchair and pushes me down the hall to a big room with tables and benches and exercise bars. Sarah comes with us. I have to answer a lot of questions. They show me pictures of things and I have to tell them, tell them what they are. I know I've seen all these things, but it's hard to remember the words. When they show me a picture of an elephant, I say, woof. Sarah giggles in my ear because she knows I'm thinking of my stuffed elephant. The blue sweater isn't happy. She picks up the next card. I am very tired. I want to sleep all day and all night, but nobody lets me. My head hurts and I feel dizzy and like I'm going to throw up. I whine. Every day, blue sweater comes and takes me to the big room where I have to do hard things. 
My arms and legs forgot how to move. She says I have to teach them all over again, like when I was a baby. I don't remember that. I whine. Mom and Dad and Sarah come to visit. Usually, Sarah stays with me while Mom and Dad go for supper. She tells me I have to hurry and get better because Mom and Dad are very sad. When I get better and can come home, they will be happier. I'm trying. It's very hard. Some days I just want them all to leave me alone. Stop making me try to do stuff. Slowly, my arms and legs start to learn how to move better. I can even walk a little if I hold on to the bars and Blue Sweater Lady helps me with a belt she puts around my middle. Her name is Joanne. She's nice, but she keeps pushing me to walk and remember the names of all the pictures. I don't call the elephant wolf anymore. That makes her happy. Sarah giggles that quiet giggle of hers. She remembers what I said before. The day I come home is very tiring. I have to get dressed mostly by myself. It's very hard to make my fingers button the buttons on my blouse. My left hand is really weak. It doesn't obey as well as my right one. But with Blue Sweater Lady's help, I get ready to go. She looks sad. I'm going to miss you, Lucy, she says. You're a fighter. We'll be back to visit, says Mom. We'll stop in after therapy. I groan to myself. More therapy? I know now what therapy is. It's blue sweater and others making me do hard stuff. It's having to try to do things I can't and trying and trying until I can. And they make me do harder stuff. Therapy is not fun. It's like if some one tells you to fly up to the ceiling, but they don't tell you how. You have to keep trying and trying until you figure it out for yourself. And my head still hurts. I just want to go home and sleep forever. I want to curl up in my own bed and read my books and whisper to Sarah and not have to do therapy ever again. But that's not what happens. What happens is Mom takes me back to the hospital every few days, but to a different room with a different colored sweater lady who makes me do more hard stuff. It sucks. My birthday comes a few weeks after I get out of the hospital. Mom says a big party with all my friends would be too much excitement. So it's just Mom and Dad, Gran and Gramps, and Sarah. Everybody brings me books and gifts, a new stuffed elephant. They all make such a big fuss. I feel bad for Sarah. I think she's jealous. She stays behind the couch most of the evening and won't even eat a piece of cake when I offer it. Sometimes Sarah comes for my therapy. She watches me from across the room. I'm nine now, only a year behind her, so she doesn't really gloat. But she gets a smug look when I can't reach the ball or forget what purple is. She also smiles proudly when I take steps by myself with just the walker or manage to write my name in wobbly letters. After a long time, I only have to do therapy once a week. I'm so happy. Sarah and I have all kinds of plans for what we'll do when I get better. Sarah says we can go outside together and play hide and seek like we used to. We can dance and twirl and roll down the hill in the park. We can run on the sidewalk all the way to the end of the street. I'm looking forward to that. I'm getting tired of sitting in my wheelchair all the time. I long to move around freely, pump my legs and run for the sheer joy of it. Will I ever be able to do those things again? Sarah thinks so. I just have to be patient. That's what mom says. I tell her what Sarah and I are going to do. She doesn't say anything. I don't think she's listening. She starts talking about bringing me some new books to read and taking me for a walk in my wheelchair. The weeks and months pass and soon I don't have to go to therapy at all. I can walk all by myself now with my walker. I can dress myself without help, brush my teeth, comb my hair, and read out loud to Sarah when she's around. She only shows up around bedtime now. She must be busy with school. I'd be in school too, if it wasn't for the accident. Sarah doesn't come to whisper me, to me so much anymore. I look for her in the dark corners of my room every night, but she's rarely there. I guess now that I'm getting better, she has other more important things to do. Before I know it, Sarah is about to turn 11. 
I don't think mom and dad even remember. They're so intent on getting me well. I ask mom if we're going to have a party for Sarah. She stares at me like I just asked if we were going to Italy for lunch. Then she walks quickly into her bedroom and closes the door. Sarah sells, tells me she doesn't mind. We'll have a private little party in my room, just the two of us. I give her a poem I've written in my uneven writing. She is very touched, I can tell, because there are tears in her eyes when she finishes reading it. The poem says, My sister Sarah is leaving me behind. Her face is turned away. I know she loves me in her heart and mind, but cannot stay. After Sarah's birthday, she doesn't come to visit me anymore. She's really gone. I know now why she always stayed in the background. I know now why mom and dad ignored Sarah. I know now why they've been so sad. It's not only because I was so broken. It's because of Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. And now over to our judges with feedback for the story, Sarah and me. Start with Echo. Oh, Louise, this story had so much heart. It, I mean, I had guessed kind of early on what had happened to Sarah, but that didn't make the journey any less um, engaging and interesting and touching. Um, you know, almost all the way through, you had captured Lucy's voice. And it just, it's almost, because I had an idea of what was coming, it almost made it that much more agonizing for when Lucy would find out um, what actually did happen to Sarah. And um, this, I mean, it really, the depth in this story is really what made me pick it for one of our top three. I mean, it was wonderful. It really was. Thank you. Jim? I agree. Um, I cried when I read this story, when I got to the end also, um, because I did not pick up on it as soon as Ekta did. Um, and then when it hit me, it, it hit hard. Uh, the characterization was, was so good. We spent a lot of time in Lucy's head with her inner thoughts, which um, really helped us, helped me get to know her uh, as a reader. Um, and it's hard to write a story that spans months and keep it all in present tense, but I thought you did, did very well with that too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, judges. Okay, so now moving on to our second place story. In second place, also winning a one year subscription to Writer's Digest magazine and their story published on our website for the community to, community to read is the story Seashell Bones written by Bethan Owen. Congratulations, Bethan. And reading Seashell Bones uh, is our guest reader, Mindy Manalix. Here I am. Seashell Bones by Bethan Owen. Jenny loved gas station money. She loved that it was soft and torn and smelled like metal. Holding it felt like she had captured a dozen people's little purchases. $20 worth of lotto tickets, a Snickers bar with almonds, an energy drink the color of mouthwash, she watched Corey through the crack in the windshield and over the BOGO fountain drink sticker on the gas station window and marked his progress. They had waited until the station was empty before Corey had pulled his balaclava on and slipped through the automatic doors. 
And now he was standing in front of the cashier with his gun in his hands while Jenny sat in the driver's seat, anticipating the familiar drawstring Nike bag in her lap and the smell of worn dollar bills. Money for a box of chocolate milk with a fragile plastic straw taped to the side. Money for a blue Bic lighter with a red thumb pedal. She would use it to build the path away from their sagging apartment and her collection of scraped together jobs and onto somewhere better, somewhere on the beach. When the gun fired, Jenny was startled but not surprised. Sometimes Corey had to shoot to prove he was real. The gun, almost more than anything, was part of the plan. When the automatic doors parted to let him reel out into the parking lot, turning on one heel like a dancer, Jenny wondered why. The day was overcast and the clouds felt close and Jenny thought it made Corey look blurry and strange as he jerked himself up from the ground and came to the car. He was hopping and stumbling and Jenny didn't like it. It was not how he, has, he had ever left a gas station before and he looked childish walking that way, silly. When he threw the car door open and pulled the balaclava off, he, he was crying and Jenny liked that even less. His face was red and pinched, his hair stuck up in the front. He looked small. He shot me, Corey gasped. He pushed one arm across his eyes to wipe the tears and Jenny was repulsed. You didn't get any money? Jenny asked as she pulled out the gas station parking lot. Usually, she usually liked pulling out fast enough that the speed of it plant slammed her back into the seat, but now her head hurt. No, Corey said, he shot me. Jenny looked at him out of the corner of her eyes. He was hunched over himself like he was about to puke. His face was still red. Jenny was suddenly afraid. A hospital, she said. We could go to a hospital, right? <laughs> no, Corey said without opening his eyes or straightening his back. The apartment, she said. She had a vision of them returning to the apartment, up the rough concrete steps, across the linoleum and into the little bathroom with the flickering light and the dripping tap. There might be bandages. There was at least water. No! and now he was shouting at her. What then, she said. No gas station money, no Arctic blast extra gum money, no prepackaged ham sandwich and cellophane money. Only Corey curled up in the chair crying like a baby with his pink shiny face. The car stank like pennies and yesterday's french fries. Where am I supposed to go? There was only so many places she could go in a car like this, with Corey like this, with no money. I don't know, he moaned. We have to hide for a while. Move the car. Jenny drove and watched the pattern of the asphalt disappear under the nose of the car. Corey's voice rose and fell as he talked about what he would do to the man in the gas station and how badly he had hurt and how they had to return his cousin's car but they couldn't go back to the apartment, maybe ever. You didn't get any money, she whispered out loud. She could feel things slipping away from her. Hot pink bottle openers, little plastic keychains from places she had never been. Corey, her stomach roiled. Jenny's throat was closing up and her eyes were burning until she forced herself to slip into the quiet, numb spaces in between the yellow dashes on the road. She tried to match her breathing to the rhythm of the road. It was difficult, but it helped. It was hard to know how long she had stayed there, but when she broke the surface again, she knew where the car was headed and where they had to go. Some of the horrible spinning feeling left her. The realization was almost enough for her to forgive Corey, who was supposed to have been part of the plan for trembling in the passenger seat. The beach house, she said. What? Corey replied. 
Now it sounded as though he was angry, and it tamped him down the spark Jenny had felt when the beach house returned to her. Jenny drove without speaking. It was far, and she shouldn't have remembered how to get there, but the beach house was guiding her. They drove for miles, but she knew the dirt road as soon as the wheels touched it. Excitement began stinging against her chest like pebbles thrown from 10 years ago. The dirt road rumbled onwards, building her anticipation for long minutes before it faded away into a patch of brown pebbles and sand. The road was gone, the beach was in front of them, and to the right, a brown shape in the distance perched on toothpick legs above the sand. From the car, it looked old and battered, but Jenny knew better. She jumped out of the driver's seat with her shoes off and had already abandoned the rough surface of the makeshift parking lot for the rich feel of the sand under her toes. Why hadn't she come back before now? What had kept her away? The only culprit she could find was the other people's money. Milk dud money, wiper fluid money, barbecue potato chip money. It was all gone now. What was left? A few shriveled dollars from babysitting? Borrowed money, resentful and disappointed in her as soon as it touched her fingers. Corey was moving slowly, so slowly that it almost made her mad again. She forced herself to return to him. He put an arm around her and leaned on her too hard so that her back hurt as they walked towards the house. Up the steps, there were only three of them and Jenny could feel her excitement increasing with every step as she drew up a little closer to the house. Jenny had been afraid at first that the door would be locked, but she wasn't anymore. It was open. The house wanted her. The house was warm inside and smelled of fish and salt. The windows were shut, but the curtains still fluttered and made the orange and pink light they had caught waltz through the room. The wood floor was streaked with sand and the sand was streaked with glitter. Jenny stopped in the doorway, overwhelmed. Corey groaned, it stinks in here, he said. She pushed him away and he fell onto one knee on the floor. Jenny thought he was crying again. She hated him. She stood in the center of the room and could see almost everything. The living room spilled into the little kitchen where she recognized the soft wooden cupboards. Inside them, there would be the familiar chipped white mugs and plastic picnic plates. The bathroom was out of sight, but she knew that as soon as she stepped through the door, she would be 10 again, with lines of white salt on her sun-faded blue swimsuit trailing sand across the floor. Her parents and Marie's parents would be in the living room and Marie would be waiting for her outside. Corey had pulled himself onto the futon in the middle of the living room. Jenny had slept on that futon before, every night for weeks sometimes. She wondered exactly how many nights she had slept there and how many hours of her life she had spent on that futon waiting for the sun to come up again so she and Marie could run outside and into the sea again. She had never needed a plan in the beach house. Corey was bleeding. She could see little red snakes of blood slithering out of the wrinkles of his t-shirt and soaking into her futon. It had been the color of orange sherbet, and now it was ruined. Jenny's heart was beating in her mouth. Get me something, Corey gasped. Like what? A towel, a first aid kit, tweezers, anything. Jenny had the sudden urge to bring him a seashell from the beach. They could pack his wound with sand, and it would be like the times she and Marie had buried each other's legs, only to reveal them in a sparkling shower, smooth and whole again. She went to the bathroom instead. The same plastic shower curtain with red and blue stars was waiting for her there, hanging bravely on the rod. The rug was the same, but it had been bleached whiter than she remembered. 
she suddenly imagined Corey dripping blood onto it, and it made her move faster. She opened the little cabinet under the sink and found a tiny tube of sunscreen, twisted it hard in one direction with dried white lotion crusted around the rim. Jenny thought she might have used the same tube of sunscreen once. She held the tube gently in her hand. She couldn't remember. Jenny carried the first aid kit from the bathroom back to Corey. The orange sherbet futon was ruined. There was a dark patch of blood on it that had gone soft around the edges as it bled into the fabric. So bright and horrible, you couldn't see anything else. Jenny thrust the first aid kit at Corey without a word. He opened it with dirty fingers and fumbled through the contents. Three little band-aids fluttered to the ground like dead leaves and Jenny could see in the flashes that they were the pink ones with hearts on them. <laughs> they had been too young for her, even when she, she had last been here. This is useless, Corey said, and he was sinking back deeper into the sherbet. His words were angry, but his voice was tired. He was sagging back against the cushion. He looked as though he could vomit or fall asleep. It did feel, it did all feel useless when Jenny looked around. There was nothing in the first aid kit but children's band-aids and an ancient bottle of Neosporin. The orange and pink glow inside the house was still warm. What do we do now? She asked Corey. I don't know, he said. But he closed his eyes and that was the real answer. Jenny thought that maybe she should sit on the futon next to him. She could imagine the warmth of his body and the warmth of his blood curling around her if she did. She sat in the rippling orange square on the floor where the light shone through the curtains instead. She was glad to be here rather than on the sticky linoleum of the apartment they shared. She had played on this floor with Marie. It hadn't been so long ago. The floor had been sandy then, but now it was a mixture of sand and dust, alternately soft, and sharp under her palms. Jenny couldn't remember what Marie was doing now. College, she thought, they, they didn't speak anymore. She didn't know why. Had Marie come back to his be this beach house? Jenny thought she would have been able to see some sign of it if she had, but the house felt empty, a cocoon that was just a soft cracked shell now. She thought of gas station money and everyone else's purchases that she had only been able to touch but not hold. Fruit cup money and money from strange candy bars that were only found in gas stations. Money for gas to drive far away. That was the money she had liked most of all. Corey had gone very quiet on the futon. She had never seen him this quiet before. Jenny knew she should do something. They couldn't stay here. But it was hard to move, and their plan was as ruined as the orange sherbet futon where Corey had draped himself, blanched and bloody, and very, very still. She forced herself to her feet and drifted across the floor. She pulled on the handle of the door, but it wouldn't open. She recognized the firm, gentle resistance of it warped from the seawater. Her father had told her, and she knew that she could get it open if she pulled hard, harder. As a child, she had pulled harder. Jenny went back to the orange square on the floor and lay her cheek against the warm, worn wooden floor. It was warm there and soft among the dust. Thank you, Mindy. Now back to our judges with feedback for the story, Seashell Bones. Uh, first of all, Mindy, thank you so much for reading. Um, you did a wonderful job. Thank you, Bethan. Mindy. I appreciate it. Bethan, this story, from the very first opening lines about the gas station money, I was hooked. I wanted to know more. And your descriptions all the way through of all the ways that people use gas station money 
um, kept me pinned to my seat for sure. Um, and you know, it, it's very obvious early on from the cracked windshield that something is not right. And, you know, it, I think you did a really good job of foreshadowing what possibly was going to happen, even though I wasn't sure until I got to the end what Corey's fate would be. Um, and Jenny's insistence on no money, no money. And just that the way that she kept asking that question, you know, reiterated for readers for sure, how much that meant to her. And it wasn't just about the money. It wasn't just about getting away and all those things that we normally think about. Um, it was what the money represented to her. And you depicted that so beautifully in all of your descriptions and um, in what you held back, uh, what you didn't tell us about what Jenny's life was like before definitely helped us fill in the lines. I think your story was a wonderful example of restraint and how the silences can definitely tell us more sometimes than an overabundance of description. So well done. It was a wonderful story. Thank you. Tim? Uh, likewise, that opening drops us right into the character's mind as well as the action. And then from there, all of these things that she that she wants to buy, she's not thinking grandiose like a car or a big house. It's very, very day-to-day -day stuff, which tells us as much about her and, and her life with Corey. Um, I also like that the story engages all the senses, the smell of the money, the color of the drinks, uh, even even time, um, which is, time is a sense, right? I think, oh no, that's a person. Yeah. I don't know, but where she walks in the house and she's 10 again. So we even have a little, a little um, mental time travel. Uh, and then of course that, that beautiful, unresolved ending is is perfect for me um so very great job thank you everyone i i really appreciate it thanks thank you judges and congratulations again bethan okay, and now for the moment we've all been waiting for in first place winning a one-on-one -on -one consultation with Ted Sanders from the Department of English at the University of Illinois, a professionally taken headshot for their author portfolio, a genuine leather writing journal, and their story published on our website for the community to read is The Story Lulu by Andrea Algali. Here we go. <laughs> Andrea. Hi. Thank you so much. All right. Now reading her story, Lulu. Andrea. Brooke stood shoulder to shoulder with mom in the Luna's express elevator. She ran her fingers through the ends of her dyed blue hair. Mom hit the button for the 63rd floor. She pursed her lips in disapproval. Your beautiful hair. I love it, Brooke scowled. It's my treat for getting my spring break ruined. She was supposed to have had 10 days of freedom from school and band, spent with best friends Phoebe and Rena. They had planned one big slumber party, rotating houses so nobody's parents got too sick of them. Rena had just gotten her driver's license and Phoebe, that sly girl, had snagged a bottle of vodka from her parents' liquor cabinet. But mom had to fly down to Tampa to shuttle grandma into assisted living. And in a stroke of bad luck, the trip coincided with dad's annual business trip to New York. It'll only be four days, mom said. Then you can spend the rest of the break back home with your friends. Aunt Jen's weird, Brooke said. Mom glared at her. Well, she is. Why couldn't I have just stayed home? You know why. We weren't drunk. Mom turned to face her. You're 15, it doesn't matter. You were caught drinking on school grounds. The last thing I need is our house becoming party central while I'm a thousand miles away. Could I at least have my phone back? Your phone will be waiting for you at home. The elevator dinged when it reached the 63rd floor. Just remember, mom whispered as they stepped into the corridor, your aunt's been through a terrible tragedy. Try to muster some compassion. Please, can I come with you to Florida? 
sweetie, it's not going to be a beach vacation. Grandma isn't going to want to move and it's going to get ugly. Brooke would rather listen to grandma fling obscenities and possibly precious moments figurines at them than be left alone with Aunt Jen for four days. Once upon a time, Jen had been the cool aunt. She bought her Gold Coast condo at a significant bargain, and she and her five-year-old daughter Sophie embraced big city life. But everything changed when Sophie died in a freak accident. Since then, Jen had become a ghost at the top of the world. She never left her condo. Her friends avoided her, having run out of words of comfort where no comfort was to be had. Nobody wanted to get too close, just in case such tragedy was contagious. Mom knocked on the door at the end of the corridor, and it opened immediately. Jen looked older than Brooke remembered. Gray streaks dulled her blonde hair. Her once sparkling blue eyes reflected shadow. Hi, sweet girl, Jen said to Brooke. I like it, your blue hair. She offered a faint smile. Come in. Jen clasped Brooke's arm with icy fingers. Brooke swallowed an urge to shake her aunt's hand off. She turned to say goodbye to her mom, but her mom had disappeared. Oh, that's nice, didn't even say bye. The condo was a corner unit and three wall to ceiling windows gave the illusion of total exposure at the top of the world. A white sectional sofa centered the room. A vase of purple orchids rested atop a glass coffee table. On the one wall that was not a window hung a piece of modern art, white canvas splattered with red paint, like blood. Brooke shuddered, but when she turned her attention to the view out the glass walls, her dread turned to awe. Other high-rise condominiums surrounded the Luna in a mishmash of architectural styles and heights. Beyond the skyline, Lake Michigan curved into turquoise infinity. Morbid fascination quickened her heartbeat when she saw the balcony. Little Sophie had spent the last moments of her short life there. The wrought iron railing looked flimsy, a piddly barrier against a terrifying drop into the void. Wind rattled the plastic sheet that covered a stack of outdoor chairs. The sliding glass door shimmered golden and warm. A cloud floated by the window. Brooke blinked. They were on the 63rd floor, which was high, yes, but the Luna seemed to have risen high into the sky, above the clouds, leaving the other high rises so far below that they looked like children's toys. Brooke stared into the blue, her mouth dry with wonder. No building could possibly be this high, could it? They had to be hundreds of stories up, tens of thousands of feet above the earth. Brooke's heart swelled with a giddy desire to stroll out to the balcony and climb atop the railing. She could bathe in the blue of the sky. She could spread her arms like eagle's wings. She imagined diving into the cotton embrace of the clouds. Then, she saw the little girl with blonde hair on the balcony clutching the iron balusters, her back to Brooke. Sophie? The girl looked over her shoulder and giggled. Color the sky with me, Brooke. But her plastic lips did not move. Her eyes were painted. A doll. Don't go out there. Brooke's eyes flew open at the sound of Jen's voice. What the hell? Her eyes had been closed, but she didn't remember closing them. She had walked across the room to the sliding glass door in a dream. Fully awake now, heart pounding, she saw that the condo was no longer taller than the other Gold Coast high rises surrounding them. The sliding glass door was firmly closed. No doll stood in the balcony. Brooke's hands trembled as she rubbed her eyes. Come, Jen said in a softer voice. I'll show you to the guest room. Brooke didn't want to go to the guest room. She wanted to go home. Nothing like that. And what had happened? A trance? Dream? Had ever happened to her before. She had never walked in her sleep. She had never fallen asleep on her feet. If Jen hadn't spoken, she might have sleepwalked right out onto the balcony and toppled over the railing, like Sophie. Brooke followed Jen to the guest room, which thankfully had solid walls and no balcony, just a small window. No paintings hung on the white walls, no frilly trinkets, just a double bed, a bedside table, and a closet. Brooke's heart jolted. The doll in the corner stood the same toddler-sized doll from her dream. The doll's curly blonde hair was pulled back in a messy ponytail. The eyes, painted blue, 
were framed by honey blonde lashes. Whoever had made the doll probably intended the smile to be sweet, but to Brooke, it looked sly. Its left arm rested at its side. The right arm was angled as if it were about to do a karate chop. Are you all right? Jen asked. That doll, Brooke started. That's Lulu, Jen said. Sophie found it in her closet right after we moved in. She smiled sadly. She named it. She loved it so much. Oh, Brooke struggled to think of something to say. Mom had explained that the topic of Sophie would likely be taboo. You must miss her, she managed. Jen's gaze fixed on the doll as if speaking to it and not to Brooke. If, it, if I hadn't been so distracted. I don't even remember what I was doing or why I left the sliding glass door open. Sophie knew she wasn't supposed to be on the goddamn balcony. I remember hearing her say, you can touch the sky. I ran, I screamed at her to get off the railing, but I was too late. One minute she was my whole world and the next, she choked, holding her hand over her mouth. Then she blinked at Brooke. Oh honey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to dump that on you. She fled the room. Brooke sat on the edge of the bed feeling sick. She heard muffled sobs from the bathroom. Should she go to Jen? Did Jen want to be alone? Brooke hated how sad her aunt was and that the pain would never end. An abrupt movement at the corner of her eye jerked her attention to the doll. Its right arm had fallen to its side. Brooke stared at it with growing revulsion. She wanted to hide the doll, but she didn't want Jen to come back and notice it missing. She backed out of the room and closed the door. She wandered into the kitchen. She needed to leave, at least for the day. She could wander around downtown, find a coffee house, and not come home until nightfall. She fumbled through drawers until she found a pen and a notepad. She sat on a bar stool so that she could compose a note to let Jen, Jen in on her plan. Her gaze was pulled back to the view outside the glass walls. Mesmerizing blue sky, Lake Michigan as far as the eye could see. Brooke found it difficult to look away. She tried to scoot off the bar stool, but her muscles would not move. She tried to write her note, but her hand holding the pen just swirled in circles, leaving doodles that looked like fluffy clouds. Oh well, why go anywhere when I have such a view? Puffs of clouds undulated just outside. The glass walls shimmered gold and melted. The clouds rolled into the condo in a fine mist, tickling and caressing her. She fell off the stool into the floor, dipping her hands in the clouds. Soon she would float weightless and free. She would become one with the sky. You can color the sky with me, a little girl's voice whispered. Clouds clung to her fingers like cotton candy. She laughed, her body rolling with weightless glee toward the open sliding door. The balcony was gone. Lulu stood where the balcony should have been. Her sly smile circled into a scream. Inside her mouth, a black void swirled. No! Brooke clung to the floor with all her strength. The world tilted and the wind filled her ears. She woke up on the white sofa. Full darkness had fallen outside and the room was lit only by the moon and a multitude of city lights. Something lay cradled in her arms. Lulu. She flung the doll aside with a guttural cry, feeling as revulsed, repulsed as if she had awakened to find herself cradling a tarantula. She stared at Lulu, heart pounding. Lulu gazed back with her painted blue eyes. There was no sign of the black void in her mouth. Still shaking, Brooke tried to turn on the lamps, but none of the switches worked. She trotted down the shadowy corridor to the master bedroom and rapped on the door. Aunt Jen? Nothing. She felt her way down the corridor to the guest room. The lights did not work in there either. She barricaded the door with the bedside table. As long as the doll and the balcony were on the other side of the door, she was safe. She changed into her nightshirt and slipped into bed. She didn't think she'd be able to sleep, but she fell right into a vivid dream. In it, she sat on the bar stool in Jen's kitchen. Sun poured through the transparent walls, giving the white furniture a golden hue. Sophie, her blonde curls held back in a ponytail, just like Lulu, 
colored a picture of a rainbow and clouds scribbling the background sky periwinkle blue. Come color the sky with me, Sophie said. Brooke joined her in coloring using a midnight blue crayon. As she colored, clouds floated out of the picture and tickled her hands. Sophie had abandoned the picture. Instead, she danced around the room singing with Lulu. The sliding door had been left ajar and Sophie skipped right and skipped onto the balcony. Hey, you're not supposed to go out there. Brooke's muscles froze. She could not move. She could only watch helplessly as Sophie did a few princess twirls on the balcony. Sophie set Lulu on one of the patio chairs. The doll's head twisted to the right and its eyes fixed on Brooke. Everything jolted. Brooke was no longer on the bar stool. She had shrunk into the little girl twirling with glee on the balcony. The sun was warm, the sky blue and infinite. The wind ripped at her dress and hair. How nice of Lulu to open the door for her. Silver airplanes sparkled in the sky like magic wands. Mermaid hands waved from the lake. Lulu wanted a better view. Lulu wanted to touch the, touch the sky. The railing was in the way. Brooke pushed the chair against the railing and climbed onto it. Now she could see forever. She wanted to show Mommy, but Lulu said she didn't need Mommy's help. She just needed to lean over a little more. She balanced on her tummy on the railing and slid forward. She could see straight down. The people looked silly, like tiny bugs, and cars looked like toys. Lulu whispered that she could fly right into the blue if she wanted to, if she just slid forward a little more. The wind roared in her ears. She was so cold. Brooke's eyes flew open, her heart pounding. The wind still roared in her ears. This was no dream. She was on the balcony, balanced on a patio chair, cradling Lulu to her heart. Thousands of lights blinked as far as she could see. The lake shimmered under a full moon. Play in the dark with me, Lulu whispered. This time we'll paint the sky black. Brooke climbed onto the balcony's railing in her bare feet, her nightshirt billowing around her legs. We'll dance on the stars together, Lulu giggled. With feet as light as a fairy's, Brooke leaped into the abyss. Five years later, a businesswoman by the name of Maureen Dorner bought a corner condo on the 63rd floor of the Luna for a song. The condo had been on the market for years and its price kept dropping, mostly because of the history of tragic deaths. Most people wouldn't want a place haunted by so much pain, however gorgeous the view, but Maureen believed in bargains, not ghosts. When she entered the condo, it was mostly empty. A few dusty boxes here and there, a paintbrush with dried paint on it, and a doll with long dyed blue hair standing beside the door to the balcony. Maureen shuddered. She hated dolls. That thing had to go. She turned her attention to the view, which took her breath away. Oh, wow. Come paint the sky with me, a whisper beckoned. A cloud floated past the glass walls. Maureen smiled, eyes closed, and walked toward the balcony. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> now back to our judges with feedback for the story, Lulu. Andrea, this story surprised me from start to finish, and that's why it was easy for me to pick this as my top choice out of the entries. I just I don't read horror stories usually. I'm not one to really, you know, enjoy that genre very much. But I think that's a lot of, a lot of times because some horror stories, not all I know, um, but some of them kind of get into like the slasher sort of, um, you know, genre, which I'm not a fan of uh, at all. This had um, very Alfred Hitchcock type tones for me. And I love Hitchcock's films. Huge fan of his work. Um, and it just, it kept surprising me. I kept waiting for the good, you know, to come in and it never did. And I enjoyed it all the way to the end. Um, I don't think I will ever be going up to the 63rd floor of anything on the Gold Coast, no matter how enticing it might be. Um, and you know, it also made me laugh early on when you mentioned the precious moments figurines. I haven't thought about precious moments in years and yet it just that one 
small piece of description um, really nailed down the age of Brooke's grandmother and what at one time was a very popular thing to have and do. Um, and, you know, just little touches like that really, uh, you know, cemented the story for me. And like I said, it just surprised me from start to finish. Um, I kind of want to know how the, the doll got up there in the first place. If you ever write more, I would love to read it, really, you know, because I really want to know more about this whole little world that you've created. Um, well done. It was wonderful all the way, all the way through. Thank Absolutely. You. you know, from vaudeville ventriloquist through Hitchcock, through not Hitchcock, but um, Rod Serling's Twilight Zone TV, and then Night Stalker, if you're old enough to remember that, and up through Chucky, all of these creepy dolls have been around, but as Ecta said, a lot of them turn into slashers um, or have just a, some, some visible evil in them, whereas this one doesn't. It's such a fresh take on, on a, a haunting doll um, who, through, through kindness and love, let's paint some pictures, uh, brings people to, to their demise, or at least these, these two little girls. Um, as Acta said, could be ageless. This could be a spirit that has gone through generations. Um, the story itself, so many strong elements. It was foreshadowing, foreshadowing the alliterative sentences, strong characteriz characterization, not only in Brooke, um, but also the condo itself. The, it has its, its own personality. Um, also, your dialogue was very good, especially in that opening scene. It doesn't get bogged down with a lot of tags, you know, she said, mom said, I said, uh, it just mo um, moves so swiftly and advances the story. Um, the pacing is also, not just the dialogue, but the entire story I, I liked a lot. So it was, it was, a, it, it was very worthy of, of first place in this, this contest. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, judges, and congratulations again, Andrea. Thank you so much. I'd like to once again congratulate all our winners. Um, a big thank you to Ekta and Jim. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And okay. I'd like to also congratulate everyone who entered, who managed yes. to get a story down and, and sent in. So thank, thank everyone for participating and, and hope to do it again. Yes. We're very grateful to have um, a group of writers in the community that attend the workshops and are always interested and always participate. Because of you, these workshops are possible, so thank you. And keep writing, everyone. I mean, you know, even if you didn't win this time or place this time, um, those stories still have merit. Keep revising, keep working on them, keep attending the library's workshops. I think our library is doing such a wonderful job of providing us with these workshops, even in these challenging times. Um, you know, so just keep at it. Don't give up and um, happy writing, especially through the winter. This, you know, I think it's a good season to, to, to sort of knuckle down and work on some of these projects. Indeed. And follow Ecta's blog, follow her on Twitter. She has a lot of great advice for writers. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.